Okay, first of all, let me say that I come from one of these families which is described um, as, I don't know if it's called a migrant family, but I have family in the United States, in Canada, in England, and I guess, of course, I have family in Africa who I don't know, um, which is, of course, of increasing interest to me. But the fact is that for centuries, um, people from this country and this region have come through forced migration in the first place and then have continued to move subsequently to opportunities which were available or which were not available in Jamaica, which were available in Panama and Costa Rica and Cuba, etc. So um, it's almost something in my blood, which I have been thinking about more and more as time has gone by, because there are many implications of having family or scattered all over the place in diasporas. So that has been one of the elements. Two, I think there's the fact that when you look at the way in which we are dealing with the people, the human resources, what they're calling human capital, we're actually preparing many of our people to leave, you know? And I have, um, in the last dec two decades in which I've worked in, at UWI, Many of the students who I taught or had discussions with about migration and related matters either told me directly or indirectly that they too plan to move. And so we are operating in an environment in which, as Elizabeth Thomas Hope, who is one of the writers about it, talks about that migration is part of the culture of Caribbean migration. Um, and so how do we prepare for that? Is it that we have a kind of duality? Is it that we can live in two places at one time? Um, is it that we, um, as has happened with various generations, um, the previous ones were about, they, they went to go and work and buy land or return. Some have never returned, of course. But today's um, migrant, they say, is saying, we now come back. So the previous group are saying, I, um, I have the intention to return. But this group is saying, and perhaps this is a, one of the um, outcomes of globalization or whatever the explanation, the, today's millennial is going and they're not intending to return. So we have these ongoing challenges and how are we going to manage it? Of course, we've spoken a lot about um, economic remittances and social remittances and cultural remittances. But if you lose a thousand nurses each year, or you lose a thousand teachers, or whatever it is. What is the impact on the country? If the group of people who you're expecting to help to push some of the development goes and does not return. So um, those are the things that perhaps are bothering me, bedeviling me, or encouraging me to think about it. Um, and finally, um, my husband and I, my late husband and I, worked in issues of how, who migrates, and we know that migrants are likely to have greater a greater likelihood of mental illness because maybe they are greater risk takers, whatever is the reason, but also that there are circumstances in the Britons and in the United States and in the Canada which probably result in um, various both positive and negative things in what is described as the first generation or the generation and a half. So the first generation goes, and some people say that they have a kind of prophylactic, or what is it? They, they have a kind of inoculation because they carry within them themselves their minds and bodies and spirits, the whole country. But by the time you move, move to their children or the generation and a half, it's about how they're adjusting, especially as black people, to life in New York, to life in Toronto, to life in Miami, to life in London. And so um, the impact of racism and all of the things that people may not have been prepared for in Jamaica or in Barbados, they find that they now have to be dealing with in this new setting, for which many parents are completely unprepared because maybe they harbor illusions of the beneficence and benevolence of these metropolitan settings but their children have to deal with what happens on the street, at school, at work, and at home. So those could explain my interest, energy, um, 
preoccupation increasingly with these matters. Okay, so having returned from, from England, um, where my husband and I worked in Birmingham, which is of course the second largest city in Britain, um, in mental health, uh, so we were, he was working with the National Health Service, we had a private office where we met all kinds of people, not only Caribbean, but mostly Caribbean people. Um, of course, you're probably aware that there is a saying that England makes people mad. And I have to conclude that that is in fact so. What do I mean by that? I'm saying that there are stressors like racism and so on which mean that people's normal healthy development is stymied, or I wouldn't say all, but many, um, in part because the demographics and the information will tell us that many of the migrants who have went since 1948 were poor country people. And generations later, many of them have not made the advances that they hope to have made in terms of their economic situation, which then has various other kinds of knock-on effects like poor housing, unemployment, um, being in jail, etc. So um, having lived in Birmingham and then realized the difference between hearing about something and living in the country, then when we returned to Jamaica, we continued the work. And Cecil Gottsmore, who has lived between Jamaica and England over decades, brought together people who he knew. Uh, some of them had been in Britain during his particular era, and others had gone there playing different roles. And so he brought together some people who shared their experience. So, of course, this was a personal, people's personal narratives which I think is helpful because you'll find that there is a variety. Um, you'll find that there, that there are elements which relate to the time at which people were there and the issues they were trying to deal with. It reminds us that um, families um, make decisions about migration and individuals. So we don't only talk about government policy, but we also talk about people deciding, I'm gonna do this or I'm gonna do that. And so, it was very interesting, therefore, that my husband and I were asked to be presenters. And subsequent to the presentation, and we attended some of the other people's presentations, we knew some of the people and we got to know some of the people. After that, I recognized that these stories could have remained well-kept secrets, meaning if you and I know each other and we knew that we were in Brixton at the same time, that was one thing. But that information was not now coming out to the new generation of Jamaicans who themselves were in their teens and 20s, who knew little or nothing about this experience. No, some of them are going to be planning to migrate to Canada, et cetera, in the, in the present and future. But they did not really have any knowledge of what had happened in their, to their grandparents' generation. And so as one of my preoccupations over these last two decades, it's about ensuring that we not only pass batons, but we provide our people with the kind of information that can help them to make good decisions. So I presented and my husband presented and I, I spoke about, I have never met a black doctor. Uh, how, how did that come up? So we were in a building which was owned by a Jamaican doctor and nurse, very unusual. So I was a mentor in a school and there I met a girl. Her grandparents were from the Caribbean. So I said to her, Charlotte, what are you going to do when you leave school? And she said, I am going to become a solicitor or a doctor. I said, How, do you know any black solicitors? Yes, I do. Do you know any black doctors? She said, no, I don't know any. So I said, well, I know two immediately who you could um, talk to. So there we were in Birmingham. And so the young woman said, I've never met a black doctor. And on a visit to Jamaica, I was speaking to Professor Celia Christie, who is my um, counterpart from my generation. I said, Celia, you know, when you're in Jamaica, 
you're not thinking about things like this. But you realize when she went to St. Hughes um, High School, uh, which is a hundred and something years old, and uh, I went to the Queen's School, and I said to Celia, you realize that five of the people in your high school class did medicine? And I said, you know, that's very unusual, but we're taking this for granted. So that's how come mine was described as, I have never met a black doctor. And then I recognize that when you don't have your own people taking care of you, your own minister of religion, it puts you at a disadvantage. So I'm not surprised to hear that in the United States, mothers and babies who are taken care of by white medical professionals are much more likely to be sick and to die. These are tragic, um, these are tragic facts, not, not fictions. Because the truth is that a migrant community needs to have its own everybody in the new country. And that has lots of challenges for the human resources and so on and so on. So that is how I became involved. And some years after I had, um, I had been thinking about what we're gonna do with this material, I recognized that, I think I was informed that they were gonna be moving the collection it had been, of course, recorded, which was an excellent thing. It was going to be moved to the archives across the road. And I said, you know, Hillary, if you don't catch it now, something disastrous could happen. And so I, I initiated a discussion. I used some of my own personal resources, some resources through the university. And I was able to get the entire thing, um, move it from recording to paper. And I had the benefit of having Heather Monroe, who was born in England of, a Jamaican, of Jamaican parents who had returned to live in Jamaica and subsequently went to live in the United States. And then she went back to Britain and came to Jamaica. So she was able to listen and transcribe with the air that you need to pick up the different ways in which people speak. So I had the good fortune of working with Heather Monroe, who is now um, the publications editor in um, Humanities and Education. And so we put it together and we looked through it and therefore recognized that most of the, most would have been suitable for a book, but some required a different format um, that has not yet been realized. So that is why so, um, I, I, I have acknowledged the need for a bridge across our generations, because somehow it's not happening in our families. Um, people will know that they have relatives in this country or that country, but they're, they're, they're either connected to these people or they're not. We have flows of remittances, we have these kinds of things, or, uh, and or people who, have, who live in this um, new country or the old country, and there's no discussion or any dialogue about what is happening, why people went, why they didn't come back. Um, so some of it is, just not discussed. And therefore that, that lack of knowledge means that a new generation will migrate without understanding what happened to the previous generation. So that's how come I made that effort um, to, to put this book together. And I was also able to get Dr. Dr. Um, Professor Beverly Bryan to do the introduction. And she had been born in Jamaica, lived in England for many years, returned to work at UWI, and therefore she had the perspective from different angles, and she did the introduction to the book. My first visit to England when, was when I was 21. But I had been to the Queen's School, and the Queen's School had as its houses Victoria, Elizabeth, Alexandra, and Victoria. So when you grow up in a former British colony, you have not physically lived in that country, but psychologically and all kinds of olives, you have lived in the country. And so when I could imagine that when people went to England, though especially those in the earlier periods when they thought they were going quote unquote home, they were quite shocked that they were coming up on situations where, what is it, there was, you couldn't get any housing because there was no dogs, no Irish, no blacks. So this experience of, of believing you're going home and then having this rejection 
must have had serious psychological consequences for people. And so I realized that when, when I grew up in Jamaica, and I subsequently met relatives who had been in England for 30 years, 40, whatever it is, that you have had a completely different perspective of the metropolitan world. Um, further, if you have been um, relatively privileged that you went to a high school, you went to a, this, you, have, you, you know, your, my parents had studied in England in the 1950s, that your perspective on the metropole is quite different. And so I made a lot of effort to try to understand what it is to be Black and British. So my PhD thesis, which I did as a, as a mature student, was really looking at, it was called the quest for healing in the Black British community. And really I began to really understand that the context in which you grow shapes your personality tremendously. When I go to England in my 20s or when I go there in my teens or if I go there when I am two, it makes a big difference. So for example, I've been very disturbed about the Windrush people who are my age. Imagine being now 66, having lived in England for 65 years to be deported. I mean, it's just mind boggling that prejudice can last for centuries, for generations. And on one occasion, when my stepdaughter was visiting, we went to a shop to buy something. And she said to me, you didn't notice that the person didn't touch your hand. When I was paying for the thing, they gave me the change, but they put it to the side. And so I, the kind of experiences that I had had to do with growing up in Jamaica, relatively privileged, second, uh, with, with parents who had been to Britain. So England was not a place that I worshipped or thought it was going to be some wonderful, marvelous place. It was a place where for many black people, it was quite a miserable experience. I also was able to go with my husband to various mental hospitals. And so we are a lot of black people. I think uh, black people are a tiny proportion of the population, but 25% of them are in these places. So I'll give you an example of something. So my husband worked as a consultant psychiatrist in the National Health Service, very unusual for a black doctor. And so our social group was largely Pakistanis and Indians, a few white psycho, um, doctors. So on one occasion, one of his white colleagues said, are you sure your wife comes from Jamaica? So Fred said, what are you talking about? Apparently because I spoke English fluently and I was educated, it was like, but most of the people I know in Britain, the black people, are working class. How, how, how is this possible? I mean, your wife was, seems to be a bit odd. And so he explained to the man, guess what? In the same way, you have social classes in England and in wherever else. You have different social classes here. So part of it is that the novelty of meeting black people from the Caribbean who were educated and so on. It was kind of amazing to some of the people I met. Some um, people asked me, so UWI, is it a college? What is it really? Of course, I could have been exasperated and said, don't be silly. But then I had to recognize that part of this colonial um, process is that you brainwash people and suggest that where they come from is nothing. And that this new country, which they have been so kind to allow you to come into, it's just wonderful. So um, I understand why people are radicalized after living in New York or living in wherever the place is, because a lot of the things that they believed about white people and metropolitan life turn out to be not true. <laughs> uh, I therefore believe that for the current generation of people who have grown up under globalization, which gives you the false notion that there's free movement of people, that's a lot of rubbish, honestly. Uh, if you actually believe that, you are going to be in trouble. And I'm intrigued to see what is gonna happen in America in this era of the resurgence of white supremacy. 